Okay, I think we are on. Hi, everybody. Sorry, a bit of a delayed start. We had a bit of a technical issue. Um, so welcome. This is now our fourth webinar with Dr. Rafael Gomez. Um, today is embryo transfer. It's a really interesting topic. Um, very exciting for us because we've got our first one next week. So the season has officially begun. And I will pass you on to Dr. Rafael Gomez and he'll share his screen. There he is. And uh, let him take the wheel. You're muted, Rafa. There we go. There he is. Sorry, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. And sorry about the delay. Vets and technology, we don't get along. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so here it is. Uh, as you know, these webinars uh, are going to be recorded and they will be on our YouTube page of my key panel equine services. So we will get started with this one then. So we're going to talk a little bit about embryo transfers today. And I just want to have a little reminder, like in the other webinars, about what, what we've been seeing um, in the other webinars. So mares are classified as seasonal in long days. Um, they are polyesters, meaning that they have uh, multiple estrus or heats um, during the season that they are um, that they are all of their recycling with their reproductive um, that they accept reproductively at the stallion. Sorry about that. Uh, they are monovulatory, meaning that they ovulate one follicle um, per cycle, but there's uh, 7 to 25 percent of the mares that can have double ovulations, and that's a risk of having twins. Puberty comes um, at year at one year of age or uh, 18 months. The estro cycle length is 21 days plus minus 1.4 days, and the estrus per se or heat um, lasts from five to seven days. Another quick reminder is going to be the anatomy of the mare. So going from the outside to the inside, first we have the vulva, then the vestibulum, then we have the vagina. Uh, after the vagina, we have the cervix. Uh, that is a very important sphincter. Then the uterus, oviducts, and the ovaries. We're going to come back a little bit to talk about uh, the anatomy when we are reviewing the process of the embryo transfers and how we flush the mares. So... Now, what is uh, an embryo transfer? What are the embryo transfers? So it's basically the removal of an embryo from the uterus of one mare, from her reproductive uh, tract, that's the donor mare, and putting that embryo in the reproductive tract or uterus of another mare, a recipient mare. So it's as easy uh, as that. Taking one embryo from your donor mare and just putting it in the, in the uterus of the recipient mare. What are our, our recovery rates with embryo transfers? So this is uh, an statistical report made by the Colorado State University, and they found that the recovery rate is between six, well, it's 67.5%. 67.5% um, of the times we're gonna get uh, an embryo back and the pregnancy rate of those 675 um, MERS is going to be between 65 and 80%. It's, uh, it's a wide range, but this depends a lot uh, on the breeding facility, on the breeding program, on the amount of recipients that you have um, for the, for, per donor. And also it depends on where in the world you are located. So when, when can be helpful to do an embryo transfer? So it's usually when you have a really valuable mare, a genetically valuable mare, that you want to get maybe more than one fold per year for that mare. Or when you have this mare that is uh, in training or she's uh, in competition, like during the horse shows, and you really want to start breeding her because she's like an exceptional mare, you can take uh, a week off and then you can do the embryo transfer on that mare, inseminate that mare, then take the embryo and put it on a recipient, and then the recipient will do the rest. 
Uh, older mares too, uh, it is known that after 15 years old, the quality of the oocytes or eggs uh, of the mares starts uh, decreasing in its quality. So in older mares that are not able to carry the, uh, the pregnancy to full, to, full, to full term, that's also a great option. Uh, mares with musculoskeletal problems, there are some mares that may have had an injury in a tendon or even that are foundering and that you can take an embryo out of those mares and put it in a recipient mares. It's very important that uh, the mares that are going to carry the pregnancy, that they don't have any musculoskeletal problems because they're going to get heavy once they are late in that pregnancy and they need good legs and good muscles to be able to carry that full to full term. It also can be used in younger mares, younger mares that has uh, a great genetic um, value, like great genetic potential. You can take an embryo uh, in a mare that is two to three years old. Um, these mares are too young to carry a foal. So you can even take an embryo. Two years, I consider it too early, even for, for an embryo transfer, but it can be done for sure. And also with the problem mares, that those mares that have really bad reproductive problems uh, that are subfertile or infertile, uh, maybe they have endometriosis. Um, we talked about it when we did the problem mare webinar. Mares that have um, a biopsy grade three, where basically that uterus has degenerated and it's not suitable to carry a pregnancy to full term. Or mares that have just history of recurrent pregnancy loss. It could be um, uh, embryo reabsorption or that they just have stillbirths. So that's when we're going to do and we're going to think about doing an embryo transfer. So a little bit of history on the embryo transfers. So this is actually quite fun. The first ever embryo transfers that there, there is report in a mammal was made by Walter Hip in England in the 1890s. I was shocked when I saw this date. I, I was like, I, I cannot believe how he did it. It's it's a very fun uh, paper. So basically what he did, he took the embryos from uh, an Angora rabbit, that is the white, the white fluffy one. And he took two embryos from that uh, rabbit and he put it on the oviduct of a Belgian doe rabbit. Um, so that's the brown one. It's funny because after a month, when the Belgian rabbit gave birth, she gave birth to six little rabbits. Four of them were Belgian, were brown, but two of them were fluffy and white. So it, it's very interesting that it is a concept that has been with us for so, so long. Uh, a little bit of history on equine embryo transfer. So the first live fall from an equine embryo transfer was uh, in Japan in the 1974. So that's the first report that there is of a live form full from an uh, embryo transfer. Then the next year they did it uh, in a non-surgical way. So that's the way that we still do it. It's just like, it's a transcervical uh, approach uh, and a transcervical transfer. Then the first bowl, the first foal born from a frozen thought embryo was also in Japan in 1982. And then we have the first foal born from ICSI. We talked a little bit about ICSI on the last webinar. Uh, was in Colorado State University uh, in the 1996 and also in Colorado State, no, yeah, in Colorado State University. And then the first fold produced by cloning was, I think, I don't know, I, I don't know where this was, was, but it was in 2003. So these are kind of like the milestones, some of the most important milestones for equine uh, embryo transfers in the history. So we're going to talk a little bit about the donor mare now. So how, do, how are we going to select a donor mare? So we want, we want to work with mares that are healthy. Uh, they have to have good body condition. This is because they're going to have better cycles. Uh, mares that are emaciated or that are, are too thin or mares that are too fat, their cycles are going to be affected and it's going to be difficult to get embryos from them. Uh, we want mares that are going to be free of stress. That's the same handled because they're going. We're going to do like a lot of work on them. 
And ideally younger mares. This is uh, because of the oocytes uh, or eggs that they start degenerating and losing its their quality after 50 years old. So we talk a little bit about in the beginning that we want mares that are like, that they will be suitable for older mares, mares that have problems, reproductive problems. But this is like what we're looking also in that mares. We don't want mares that are emaciated. We don't want mares that have metabolic diseases because all of these th all of these things will affect the estrocycle cycle of these mares. How are we going to prepare our donor mares? So we're going to prepare them the same way that we would do for any other um, breeding season. I mean, if we were going to inseminate or do natural cover, we're just going to prepare her, prepare them in the same way. So if we want to start early, we're going to manage the photo period. We're going to put them on lights early. Uh, we're going to do a breeding soundness exam, make sure that the uterus is fine, that they don't have um, a lot of cysts or fluids, that there is not infection. We're going to have to do a thorough physical exam, check the perineal conformation. Uh, we're going to do our ultrasound, culture cytology, the speculum, vaginal speculum. We want to see that the cervix is okay. And maybe we want to do a biopsy. And uh, this is just like, it can be done, but it's not absolutely necessary. So it's basically the same as we would prepare them for any other breeding. How are we going to manage these donor mares during these uh, embryo transfer programs? So it's going to be exactly the same as if we were doing any other uh, insemination process with fresh or cooled semen. So first, we're going to have, have to find out when the mare is uh, in estrus. For this, we're going to have to palp her and do ultrasounds. Once we determine that our mare is in estrus, that we have a big follicle, that she has good edema, that she's receptive, she's presenting heat cycles, we're going to inseminate her and we're going to induce ovulation on her. We, have, we need to know exactly when that mare ovulates. This is very important for this process because we're going to flush her on day seven or eight post-ovulation. You can do the flush as early as day 6.5 and as late as day nine, day, day nine, but the best recovery rates are going to happen between day seven and day eight. When are we flushing on day, say, 6.5? When we're going to freeze that embryo, because we we're going to need an embryo that is going to be tiny. We need it to be... Um, we need to be that uh, that embryo needs to be less than 300 micrometers. So day 6.5 is uh, when we're going to do that. When are we doing day nine? If you miss the mare or something happened or you don't know when she ovulated. After day nine, embryos are really, really fragile and your your success rates are going to drop like a lot. So once... We confirm ovulation, we're going to do the flush in this uh, window of time. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the recipient mare. Now, I like to say that the recipient mares are the stars of these programs. And it is it is true because even though the donor mare might be the most valuable genetically, the recipient mare is the one that is going to be carrying that foal. And it is going, it's going to be the mom of that foal. She's going to be in charge of giving of the whole pregnancy of the foaling, then nurturing that foal and then spending uh, like, I don't know, four to six months with him. So I, I like to think of them like they're the stars. So how are we going to select our recipient mares for an embryo um, transfer program? So usually we're, we have to pick the mares in the fall or in the winter. And this is mainly because if you're going to start your donor mares in light in the winter, I don't know, in December, so they can start cycling early, you want your recipient mares to start on lights on the same day as your, as your donors. You want them to start cycling at the same time. It, it's not going to be worth it if you have your donor cycling this time of year and your recipients are just like quiet or starting to transition. Uh, we want young mares three to 12 years old, it's the ideal. Maiden or multi-purse pers mares. Um, ideally, the ideal is a mare that has had at least one foal, but maidens can be used to. Uh, we want a mare that is similar in size to the donor, 
that is in good physical health. That's important too. Uh, we need to check her musculoskeletal system and her metabolic state, um, health state too. And a mare that is known that she doesn't have any reproductive pathologies. This is sometimes hard to know. It's hard to know the history on the mares. But if you know that it's, if they're giving you a barren mare, you want to use a barren mare that is a mare that you know that it's been proving that she's been going through several estro cycles without being able to get pregnant. You don't want those mares to be your recipients. We also need a recipient mare that is uh, gentle and well handled. This is because we're going to do a lot of work with her. We have to do pubs, we have to do the transfer, then we have to do pregnancy tests. Um, and you need a mare that is going to be okay with that. You need a mare that won't stress easily uh, when you touch her or when you just grab her, because the stress is also going to affect uh, your success rate. And the ideal number of recipients per donor mare is two to three recipients uh, per donor. Um, one note on the similar size as the donor, this is the, the ideal. There's been some studies and it's been, uh, there had been some fun studies now the, where they've transferred embryos from really, really big mares to tiny mares. And you can see that the, the fetus adapts to the, to the uterus. So it doesn't grow more than what that uterus can hold. When they are born, obviously they are small and they start growing at the rate of the regular breed. But it's been known that uh, even after three years, there's different in sizes between foals um, from big mares than the foal that was transferred to a tiny mare. Also, you don't want to have a really tall mare if you're breeding, uh, I don't know, a quarter horse. Because when that baby's born, he's not going to be able to reach the other. And then you're going to have to be nursing that, that baby. And it's a lot of trouble. So you want something that is similar in size. How are we going to prepare our recipient's mare? So same as the donor mare, same as any mare that you want to breed. You want to put him in the, in the lights. If you want to start them early, we're going to do a physical exam, something very important, because a lot of times we don't know the history, uh, the medical history on the recipient mares, is to make sure that they are vaccinated and dewormed as soon as you get them. Uh, we're going to do a breeding soundness. On them, this is going to be important for the same reason. So a lot of times we don't know the history on these mares. So it's very important that we do a pop, an ultrasound, that we do a culture and cytology at least, to know that that mare doesn't have any infection or presence of inflammatory cells in, in the cytology. Uh, we wanna do a vaginal speculum. We don't wanna see any adherences in the, in the cervix or any cervical tears, uh, tears, sorry. And the biopsy, I would consider it only if it's an older mare, like older than, than 12 years old. But it's very important that it is that we have a uh, a thorough breeding soundness exam on our recipients because I, I, as I said they're going to be the starts of the program. So how are we going to manage the recipient once she's in the in the program? So same as the as the donor, we're going to synchronize them. We're going to detect the estrus. Once she's in estrus, we're going to induce ovulation. This is where. Um, where the program gets uh, interesting. We want our recipient to ovulate one or two days after the donor. There is a big window of time. They can ovulate one or two days before and they can still be used for that donor or even two to three days after the donor. Ideally, we want them to be um, ovulating one to two days after the donor. And they're going to receive... After we transfer the embryo, we're gonna put them on a, we're gonna give them a dose of anti-inflammatories, antibiotics, and they're gonna be on Regumate, uh, just because we wanna make sure that that cervix stays close um, for that embryo. Okay, the synchronization process. So we have several ways of synchronizing mares. So we have here our little reminder of the estro cycle. So it is divided in estrus and diestrus or Follicular phase and diestrus is the luteal phase because it's when you have a uh, corpus luteum. So once they're in estrus, um, if both of our mares came, um, came in estrus, then it's, it's very easy because you just have to induce ovulation. 
and playing with your inductor hormones, that is the HCG and the desloralin, to make them uh, ovulate. So once the donor has ovulated, you want to induce ovulation on your recipient. And um, with, these, with these drugs, they're going to make the recipient ovulate 36 to 40 hours uh, after, the, after the donor. So that way you'll have that perfect window. Obviously, not all of the times works that way. So there are different types of um, other drugs that we can use. There is uh, the lualize of the estromates is PGF2 alpha prostaglandins. This is used to short cycle. So that's another way the, uh, on how we can um, synchronize our mares. If you have a mare that um, that just ovulated, and you have two mares that are in diestrus. You want to give the prostaglandin at the same time, so those mares coming to hit uh, kind of like in a similar uh, time, and then you can play in that diestrus uh, phase with the with the prostaglandins to in order to synchronize the mares. It depends a lot also in the follicular stage that they have during diestrus, but you can play with the diestrus here uh, with the HCG and deslorelin, as I mentioned before, they are just um, ovulation induction agents. So once both mares are in heat, you just have to play with the hours uh, of these where, where they work. The photo period is also important uh, for the beginning of the season. When you're starting the season, you want both mares to be cycling. And then there's another treatment that is the PE treatment, progesterone plus estrogen. I put plus minus because it could be done only with progesterone. You have better results with, uh, with the two drugs. So this is what, bas what basically, basically what you're doing with this is you're putting your mare in an artificial diestrus. So you put her uh, on the P and E treatment for 12 days. You make her think that she's in diestrus and then you give um, a prostaglandin injection. And then both mares are going to come back into heat kind of like in a similar time frame. So this is what I was talking about um, for the synchronization process. We have the day of ovulation, that's our day zero. We want our mares, our recipient mares to ovulate one day after or two days after the, the donor mares. So when we're doing the flush in day seven or day eight, these mares are going to be in day five or day six, depending on when we are doing the flush. This is the ideal time frame. But if our mare, if we only have one recipient and say that, that recipient went fast in the heat uh, in her sick and she ovulated one day before our our donor mare, she still can be used uh, and is still a good recipient to use. So we're going to talk a little bit about the process. How do we do the embryo transfer? How do we um, how how do we do it? How is it going to look? So first we have to recover the embryo, and this is the process that our donor mare is going to to have. So for these. We're gonna have a bag of fluid connected to a catheter um, that is going to have an inflatable cuff in the tip. So we're gonna pass this catheter through the cervix. Once we pass the cervix, we're going to inflate this cuff and we're gonna create a door and we're gonna seal that cervix so we don't allow any fluid to go back uh, from the cervix. So everything has to come out um, through this catheter and then it comes through this wide junction to an embryo uh, filter. It's just a filter, a 75 micrometer filter that won't allow the embryo to go um, to, 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 to overflow, just to go to the other recipient that is going to be uh, underneath the filter. So how it works, it depends on the mirror and it depends on the size of the uterus. But we're going to pour fluid. It can be one liter, it can be two liters. That depends on the... Um, on the size of the mare and the uterus of the mare. If it's a mare that has had um, previous folds, uh, she's gonna have like a much more, uh, like a bigger uterus and a little bit more saggy. So it's going to need more fluid, but if it's a maiden mare, she might not need a lot of fluid. So we're gonna fill the uterus. Uh, while, while we're filling the uterus, we're gonna be um, popping the mare and we're gonna be touching that uterus that it, it feels uh, transrectally. And then we're gonna do a like a light massage and a soft massage to allow that embryo to just kind of jump into the fluid. 
And then we're going to retrieve that fluid through the filter. We're going to do this process at least three times. Uh, you can also, you can do it four times, but at least three times. The recovery rates on the first flush, like the first time you fill the fluid and then you retrieve it, the recovery rates are around 70%. So it's, it's pretty common that you would get an embryo on the first flush, but I usually do the three flushes at once, because with that, you increase your possibility of getting um, the embryo. You can also do one flush, uh, retrieve the fluid, then go and check on the microscope. If you don't have an embryo, come back, do it again and again. But I, I don't like it that way. I like to do three flushes. Uh, and I think it's a little bit more practical and less, uh, less uh, uncomfortable for the mayor, for the donor mayor. So the, the donor mare obviously is going to be under heavy sedation for these. Um, and it usually doesn't take a lot of time. After we're done with the flush, we're going to go and we're going to search for the embryo uh, in the lab under the microscope. And there are several stages of the embryo that we can find. If, we, if it's an early flush, we might find a morula. This is a really early, early uh, stage that you might find on day six, early six, 6.5. Um, other stage that we might find is an early blastocyst, also like pretty early 6.5 a day seven. Um, you can have also a blastocyst or an expanded blastocyst that, uh, this is like the best one that you can, that you can get, that you aim to get, uh, on day eight. And when we're doing that, we're going to grade that embryo. Uh, there are four grades. Uh, from one to four, excellent, good for uh, end degenerate or death. It's it's important to notice that I think seven, 71 to 73 percent of the times we're gonna get embryos grade one, and that they don't have significant abnormalities. They're gonna look like um, like the embryo on the left. I don't know if you can see my my arrow, but if no, let me put a laser pen. Maybe like this. This one is a beautiful uh, expanded blastocyst grade one. This is also a grade one. This is a grade one. This, it looks a little amorph and it has a little bit of uh, extruded blastomer. So it might be a grade two, but it's still a good, uh, a good embryo. This is, this one is also a grade two embryo that it has minor imperfections, but they are good embryos to be used. Uh, when you have a grade three uh, embryo or a grade four, your success rates are going to drop um, and it's going to be more difficult for that embryo to, to thrive. I put this image, I like to put it because it's a very beautiful embryo, but you can see that there is a lot of debris here. This is, um, this is coming from the uterus. This is not ideal, but uh, after it comes like that, we usually give the embryo a bath. So we clean it, we pass it to a... Uh, a different puddles of a special fluid that just helps us clean the embryo. So when we're transferring that embryo, we don't have any debris that might cause inflammation into the recipient mare. So after we grade our embryo, we're just going to transfer it in the recipient mare. Uh, we use a non-surgical transcervical um, transfer. So basically it's like doing uh, an insemination with fresh semen, just transcervically passing the cervix, we're just gonna deposit uh, that embryo. Obviously it's, it's more difficult because the cervix of the recipient mare is gonna be close and really, really tight. So, and we don't wanna manipulate it that much because it's uh, when you manipulate the cervix and you open it too much, it's going to release prostaglandins that might um, kill the CL and stop the progesterone and it won't, your, your transfer won't be successful. So you have to be very slow, very, very thorough and very patient. Um, and you just transfer it and you put it like uh, passing the cervix. After the transfer, the best thing to do with the recipient mare is getting her back to her usual routine. You don't want to change her hearth. You don't want to change her routine. You want her to be stress-free. She's gonna get her antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, and progesterone, but you want to keep that mare as comfortable as possible. After we transfer the embryo, we wait seven days to do the pregnancy test on the recipient mare and see if you get like 
a nice a nice uh, embryonic vesicle on that ultrasound. So what are the factors that can affect the embryo recovery? And this is just speaking about the recovery. So one is reproductive health of the donor mare. Two, the age of it. The oocyte quality is going to decrease after 50 years old. Three, what uh, the type of semen you're going to use. With fresh semen, we have a um, recovery rate of 51%. With frozen, it lowers to 33%. So it's very hard to do an embryo transfer on a frozen. It's not impossible, but it's hard. Um, the flush technique, if you don't put the cough, uh, if you don't inflate the cough enough or it's, if the cervix is not sealed, that, that might be um, one of the problems with the flushing technique. When do you collect the embryo? If you want to collect an embryo on the day early six or five, you won't find embryos. Also, if you want to do it after day nine, you, you won't have good results. The number of, uh, of flushers per season, it's been, uh, it's been studied that the maximum number of uh, like embryo transfer procedures that a donor mare can go through is five times maximum. After the, fifth, after the fifth time or at the fifth time, mares start showing inflammatory response and their uterus starts to become a little angry because you're putting a lot of fluid and then getting it back and that, that stresses the, the uterus. So ideally, they should go through this process only five times. It doesn't matter if they give you or, uh, an embryo or if they don't maximum five times per season and also the clinical experience like who is doing the the process matters just because sometimes you can miss an embryo when you're looking at uh when you're looking for it on the petri dish or you can have trouble passing the foley catheter to the donor mare so it is important to is one of the factors that may affect the recovery of the embryos so what would be the take home message? I think embryo transfers are a great option for uh, donor mares, for valuable mares. As we saw in the first slides, older mares, mares with problems, mares that are competing right now, or mares that are in training, young, young mares that you're very interested in having a foal. It's a great, great option. Recovery rates, uh, they go from 51% to 67.5%. Um, Pregnancy rates uh, from these go to 65 to 80 percent. So, I, I I believe it's a good pregnancy rate for an embryo transfer. Um, we need to remember the recipients are the stars of these programs, and it's very important to have at least more than one recipient per donor. We can we can work with one and one, but it's going to be more difficult if if the recipient comes with a problem. Uh, you you're not going to be able to inseminate your mare or if you already inseminated your mare and that uh, recipient start having making fluid or having a I don't know like an endometritis uh, process, then you you end up with a with a tough decision if you let the donor mare like carry the pregnancy or you take the embryo and you have to freeze it and freeze it and there's there's it, it gets more complicated. So it's ideally you want more than one recipient per donor. Synchronization is key. If your mares are not well synchronized, you you won't have a good success rate on the embryo transfer. You want them to be in that time frame of one or two days before um, the donor mare had ovulated to three days after. Ideally, one or two days after. The semen type is important, as we saw before. Like with fresh semen, your success rate might be fifty-one percent. Whilst with frozen semen, it's only 33%. So it is important to know that. And recommend that um, uh, embryo transfer process per season, that it's, um, it's only five cycles. So I really hope you guys like this talk a little bit of embryo transfer. It's a very wide topic. I try to really summary everything. Well, almost everything. Um, it's a topic that I really, really like. I enjoy talking about it and I, I really love doing it. So I, I, I really hope you like it. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to put it on the Q&A box. Don't forget that we have our last uh, webinar. It's March 21st and it's going to be on, on Foley. 
if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to, uh, to answer them. I actually have a question, Dr. Gomez. Yep. If a mare, if I remember correctly, only ovulates with one egg, how can you get multiple flushes from her and the, from the donor and use multiple recipients? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Steph. Well... What I mean when you're doing the flushes is uh, per cycle of the mare. So you have your mare, um, she ovulates, you do the process. Um, if she gave you an embryo, great, you have your embryo. If you don't have, if you don't get an embryo, well, you do it again, but you do it again in the next cycle. So it's basically five cycles per mare. But you, to you touch a very like interesting point that it's um, super ovulation in mares. It's, it's a difficult process, but it can be done. And you can aim uh, for your mare to ovulate two follicles with hormonal stimulations in one cycle. So if you have two follicles, ideally you want them, uh, one in the right ovary and the other in the left ovary. And you want to, uh, literally you want to make your mare ovulate double so you can have twins. And if you're flushing that mare, you might have those two, two embryos and you're going to definitely need to to recipients so that is another thing that you can do with um with the mares it's difficult to do and it's it's not as common as uh as it is with uh, with cows with cows you can do it pretty easily but it's something that you can try and do it's it works better when it's in opposite ovaries because when you try to super ovulate them and it's in the same ovary if we remember that uh, the mares they ovulate only from the ovulatory fossa so once the first follicle has ovulated there, um, where that follicle was, we're going to have a corpus hemorrhagium that is basically a clot forming there. And when the second um, follicle ovulates, sometimes this ovulatory fossa is blocked by the first uh, follicle that ovulated. So you want to do it in opposite uh, ovaries. Cool. So we have another um, question. Yeah, we have another question. Here, is there a special fluid used to flush or regular saline solution? This is a really good question. You can do it with regular saline, but it's recommended that you use a special recovery, um, a special flush fluid. It basically has a surfactant type uh, of substance that doesn't allow the embryo to stick to any of the walls of your catheters. So embryos can be a little sticky. So that's why they use this surfactant um, um, uh, substance. It's usually PVA, uh, or they used to use, I think, uh, bovine, bovine serum, I think. So it's basically that. It does that, and it allows the embryo to be more protected. Uh, it actually has some, it can have some uh, nutrients for the embryo, but at the end, it's just for the flush. After the flowers, we're going to put the embryo on a, on a special uh, media that is called holding. That one is the important one for the embryo to be in. You can do the embryo flush with saline, but I would recommend using the, the special fluid. Perfect. I don't think we have any other questions but if you come up with a question please feel free to reach out to us on any of our social media web pages and i can answer it for you thank you very much for joining us for another webinar i hope you have a great night thank you everybody this will be um as dr gomez said it is recorded so it will be up on our uh, youtube channel as soon as possible thank have you have a good night everybody